I looked at the world and I said, you know, if the cash is dead money and if our stock is viewed as dead money, we've got a choice between a fast death, a slow death. We compete against a company which has more power than God, right? Microsoft, right? Every company on earth is their customer. They're more powerful than all, but about a handful of countries on this earth. And they can do whatever they want, wrap it into their product, give it away for free if they want. I want it to be a better goal than gold. I want it to be a big tech monopoly and I want no one else to appreciate it. I want it to be underappreciated. And that's what Bitcoin was. Wait a minute, everyone. Get ready for the ultimate crypto investing website, the Bitcoin seller. It's your golden ticket to an exclusive insider's club. Expert predictions, on-chain data, and breaking news, all for you. Imagine all crypto insights landing in your inbox daily, like having your own expert team. Don't miss this VIP opportunity. Click the link and secure your spot. Join now and ride the crypto roller coaster with the Bitcoin seller. Michael Saylor, the billionaire who loves Bitcoin more than anything. A founder and executive chairman of MicroStrategy, a software company that owns more Bitcoin than any other publicly traded company won. Saylor will tell us why he thinks Bitcoin is the best thing ever and how MicroStrategy competes with Microsoft, the giant tech company that dominates the world. Michael also shares his secrets on how to make money with Bitcoin and why he thinks most people don't get it. You don't want to miss this amazing interview with one of the most passionate and visionary people in the crypto space. So grab your coffee and join us as we keep chatting with Michael Saylor. Financial assets were having the best year ever. People had great years. I mean, a lot of these hedge fund managers, they had the best year of their life in 2020 or 2021. Yeah. And Main Street assets were having the worst year in 30 years. And I had a company with $500 million in, in cash that was dead money. It was idle. It was generating 0% interest. The Federal Reserve said, we're not going to raise interest rates for four years. The company's stock was in the tank. At one point, in essence, when we were going through this, our, our company was valued at $60 a share in cash and $60 a share in, uh, in the software business. And that was like one times revenue. And so, you know, I looked at the world and I said, you know, if the cash is dead money and if our stock is viewed as dead money, We've got a choice between a fast death, a slow death, or we ride out of the cash or we take a risk. Okay, the, the, the fast death is I just give the $500 million back to the shareholders in a dividend or a buyback. Now, I knew that wasn't going to save the company because I'd been buying back the stock for the last five years. I bought $300 million worth of stock back or something. And the only thing that would happen would be this, the stock would go from $120 a share to $60 a share. And then all the stock options, the employees would be underwater. Then all the employees would get headhunted away by Amazon and Google and Facebook, you know, and, and then we wouldn't be able to compete with Microsoft. And, you know, we compete against a company which has more power than God, right? Microsoft, right? Every company on earth is their customer. They're more powerful than all, but about a handful of countries on this earth. And they can do whatever they want, wrap it into their product, give it away for free if they want. So... Yeah. So uh, the challenge of giving up the capital was first we'd lose our financial capital and then we'd lose our human capital and then we'd have no reason to exist and the company was going to zero. So notwithstanding whether you care whether a company lives or not, I didn't see uh, it in the interest of my shareholders to watch the stock go to $60 a share and then watch us slide. You know, we'd have to sell the company. So the second strategy is hold the cash, but the cash is... You know, cash trash. Ray Dalio says that is generating zero percent interest, and the money supply expanded by twenty percent a year for the past two years. You can see it in U.S. single-family homes, which shot up forty percent in price. And so, if the money's being devalued twenty percent a year, and you're generating zero percent interest, you got a negative real yield of minus twenty percent. And I did the math in my head, and I concluded that pretty much the five hundred million dollars in purchasing power would be cut into two hundred fifty million dollars of purchasing power, and 36 to 48 months. So that's that's a slow death. It's it's uh, I could use cash to pay my employees, but ultimately we were sitting and mired. And, uh, and so that doesn't work. And so in that situation, we decided we should do something transformational. Mm. And, you know, and, and if you went into a Harvard B school class and corporate strategy said, what are you going to do 
the investors want the cash back. You can't generate a yield on the cash. The company needs to grow. Well, the answer is you do a transformational acquisition. So if I could have bought VMware, or if I could have bought WhatsApp, or if I could have bought Snapchat, or if I could buy like a super high growth digital monopoly or some uh, some moonshot thing that would go to the sky, then yeah, maybe that saves the company. But those are few and far between. Yep. Most of the time, these acquisitions that you do are dilutive. And I knew they're dilutive because like Pete, it's not my first rodeo. I lived through this. I invented, uh, you know, I launched 12 different product lines to grow the business and, I, and there were singles and doubles or whiffs. And I know that just innovating won't always help you. And then I bought the stock back and I, you know, and I knew that didn't work. And then I spent hundreds of millions of dollars on sales and marketing to expand the business and that didn't work. Hmm. And so I, and then I watched all my competitors Business Objects, Cognos, every company, I watched them do acquisitions to try to grow and every one of them failed in that strategy. There was a 99% mortality rate. Wow. Every The reason we're the biggest independent business intelligence company left is because the other 100 all went private, got bought up, got amalgamated and sucked into the bowels of IBM and Oracle and then dismantled over the course of 20 years. So- I kind of knew, I tried everything for a mm. decade. I knew it wasn't going to work from first, you know, from first observations. So I thought, well, what if I could find a digital gold, which was better gold than gold, something that is better than gold, but also a big tech monopoly. Michael Saylor tells us why he decided to invest in Bitcoin and how it saved his company from dying. His company had a lot of cash, but it was not making any money. The Fed kept the interest rates low, which made the cash lose value over time. His company's stock also went down, and people thought it was boring. Saylor had three options, give the cash back to the shareholders, keep the cash, and watch it become worthless, or use the cash to buy something else. By giving the cash back to the shareholders would not help his company grow, and keeping the cash would make him lose half of it in a few years, and if he pays his employees with cash would not motivate them. Michael Saylor decided that he needed to do something different. He thought about buying another company that was growing fast, like VMware, WhatsApp, or Snapchat. But those deals were hard to find and often failed. He tried other ways to grow his company, like making new products, buying back stock, and spending more on sales and marketing. But none of them worked. He saw his competitors fail with acquisitions too. He needed to find a digital gold that was better than gold and acted like a big tech monopoly. He found that in Bitcoin, here are my three criteria. I want it to be a better goal than gold. I want it to be a big tech monopoly. And I want no one else to appreciate it. I want it to be underappreciated. And that's what Bitcoin was in the second quarter of 2020. The instant, no one thought it was an institutional asset. Even though Amazon stock had doubled in the second quarter, uh, Bitcoin was trading about the same as it had been trading in 2018 or 2019. You know, it had been. It got up to ten thousand. It had smashed down to four thousand. It was back at ten thousand. So I looked at it. and I said, "Well, you know, based on all the information, you would think that a digital property network or a global digital money network is more valuable, knowing that people are losing confidence in currencies, losing confidence in central banks, losing confidence in governments, and this is." a non-sovereign, open, decentralized system. So, so we're there, we have to take a risk. We literally have to, or we got to sell the company, right? We're done one way or the other. And I said, well, this is a reasonable risk because it looks like, it looks like the Facebook of money or the Google of money in the year 2010 or 2011. While 98% of the world doesn't understand it, it's a bit too complicated, they're afraid of it. But just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it isn't true. It just means, right. you know, and, and I had the experience of writing the mobile wave yep. and I'm the guy in 2011 that bought Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google stock, uh, you know, and they all worked out well. And I thought the year's 2020, we're at the end of the mobile wave. You know, I, I tell a story of, you know, I tell a funny story in the mobile wave about my niece on a beach and she's like, I don't know, eight years old and she wants the big apple. And I said, oh, you want to go to New York City? Uh, and she said, like, give me the big apple for my birthday. And I said, you want to go to New York City? She goes, no, I want the iPad. And I thought, 
Okay, little girl wants an iPad. That means that the entire world wants this, and this is going to be a big deal, so buy Apple stock. Well, in 2020, I'm talking to the same niece, and I said, what do you think? And she goes, yeah, well, I just bought some Amazon stock. And like Amazon is trading at like $3,300 a share, you know, and, and it just doubled. I'm like, okay, well, if 20-somethings now know they should buy Amazon and Apple and Google, this is not an... This is not a misunderstood technology trend anymore. Every Uber driver understands that. So get off the mobile wave, get on the crypto wave, and, and think that through. Michael Saylor tells us what he likes about Bitcoin and why he thinks it is better than gold and big tech. Michael has three criteria for choosing an asset. It has to be better than gold, it has to be a big tech monopoly, and it has to be underappreciated. For him, Bitcoin met all these criteria in the second quarter of 2020. No one thought Bitcoin was a good investment for big institutions. From Michael's perspective, even though Amazon stock had doubled in that quarter, Bitcoin was still cheap and stable. Bitcoin went up and down between 10,000 and 4,000, but it didn't change much. He looked at Bitcoin and he saw a digital network that was more valuable than money because money was losing trust and power. Bitcoin was not controlled by any government or central bank and it was open and decentralized. He had to take a risk and buy Bitcoin, or he had to sell his company. He thought it was a reasonable risk because Bitcoin looked like the Facebook or Google of money in 2010 or 2011, when most people didn't understand them. He had the experience of riding the mobile wave, and he was the guy who bought Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google stock in 2011, and they all worked out well. He thought the year was 2020, and the mobile wave was over. He tells a funny story in his book, The Mobile Wave, about his niece who wanted an iPad for her birthday, and he realized that meant the whole world wanted it. He bought Apple stock because of that. He says in 2020, he talked to the same niece, and she said she bought some Amazon stock. Amazon was trading at $3,300 a share, and it had just doubled. That meant that everyone knew that Amazon, Apple, and Google were good investments. This was not a new technology trend anymore. He said every Uber driver knew that. He decided to get off the mobile wave and get on the crypto wave and think that through. And don't forget to subscribe to Bitcoin Sella. You will get the most important news in your inbox every day and for free. Don't miss this opportunity. If you like the video, hit that like button and subscribe for more daily updates. Remember, knowledge is power, and we're here to help you on your money journey. Until next time, happy investing.